an intimate look at Queen Elizabeth's life and reign as she celebrates her Diamond Jubilee. She's led the way in, in doing walkabouts, and long may that continue. She's put up with a, a lot, and we're still on speaking terms, so I think that's <laughs> no mean achievement. Through the eyes of Prince William and other family members. The Queen has, has provided a, a huge stability and a huge wealth of experience for those that want to tap into it. Following her at work for over a year and a half. She's a proper professional at her trade. Always important every now and again to look at how it's how it's really done. And revealing the story of her extraordinary young life. Who was 25. You think about how young that is for somebody to take on this incredible responsibility. For her at that age, it must have been incredible having that burden. The Diamond Queen. It's spring 2010. Hello, Queen. She's making a regional visit to Wales. This is what she does, a symbol of the country on legs. She's been on parade for six decades, seen it all, but watching as closely as ever, remembering names, comparing. Her role includes jobs done in other countries by presidents, but also native traditions presidents know nothing about. She never stops, rarely pauses. Every day, almost every hour is carefully planned. We talk about veteran politicians out on the campaign trail. This is the real endless, perpetual campaign, year in, year out. And in terms of pressing the flesh, meeting people, this is the real veteran. She's here one week after her 84th birthday, but retirement, never mind abdication, seem to be words never mentioned in her presence. This is a typically busy schedule on a two-day visit to North Wales. She's getting about. The Queen has a private motto. I have to be seen to be believed. And this, of course, is a family trade. She's professional. You know, her ability to, to know how to, to move around, to who to speak to, and, and how to also um, engage with people, you know, within a few split seconds of meeting them. And the way that she carries herself forward smiles constantly able to go into a room and bring the room to life you know th these are the things that at her age she shouldn't be doing um, and yet she's carrying on and doing them um, and not only in this country but all around the world to some extent that's in the genes i think there is an understanding of, of getting out and about you, you actually have to go and meet people to find out what's what's really going on and to give people a sense of your understanding uh, what is happening Whenever Granny walks into a room, everyone stands up, stops, and just kind of watches her, because obviously it's huge when she walks into a room, and I find that incredible. I kind of go... <laughs> now, of course, she's not ordinary. She's very rich, privileged, protected, and cherished. Different in so many ways, big and small. She doesn't need a passport or a driving license, though her husband does. But more important, she's only the fourth in what is effectively a new royal dynasty, stamped with her personal style, but built by her grandfather in years of mayhem and war. The First World War toppled the monarchies of Russia, Germany and Austria. George V faced criticism that his family, saxe coburg gotha were somehow pro-German, and he knew there were anti-royal murmurings at home. When the writer H.G. Wells spoke of an uninspiring and alien court, King George retorted, I may be uninspiring, but I'm damned if I'm an alien. In 1917, he changed all the German-sounding family names, and not knowing what his own surname might really be, he chose Windsor for its thoroughly British ring. He insisted the royals crisscross the country, visiting hospitals, towns and barracks. And a lot about today's monarchy comes from him. For the Queen, this was not something that she had to read about in books. The Queen remembers very well the man she played with when she was a small girl. She called him Grandpa England. And George V really was the man who made the Windsors. 
Her father was George V's second son, Prince Albert of York, who'd married a cheerful young Scottish aristocrat, Lady Elizabeth Bowes Lyon. She turned him down twice, but it turned out to be a very happy marriage, so that Princess Elizabeth Alexandra Mary spent her early years in a private world of quiet security. But when she was born, it was a time of turbulence. April the 21st, 1926, and there is a really uneasy air in the country. The general strike is just about to start. A lot of people predict a revolution, and a princess is born, third in line to the throne, here in Bruton Street, a fairly posh part of central London, but in a relatively normal house owned by her aristocratic grandparents. Later, the German bombs would remove it, and it's now possibly one of the dullest buildings in central London. At eight months, her parents left her to take a six-month sea voyage to Australia and New Zealand. Her mother was very upset to leave the baby, but the empire called. Duty first, family feelings second. Her parents were following the rule book set out by her grandfather, George V. Get out there, be seen, work hard. His wife, Queen Mary, once retorted to an exhausted princess who complained she was tired of traipsing round hospitals. We are the royal family and we love hospitals. If you're looking for a motto for this queen's 60 year reign, it's not a bad place to start. Celebrities court the camera. They open up. The Queen is not a celebrity. Cameras court her, and she doesn't. Is this instinctive or something she's learned? Well, it's shrewd. Celebrities flare, and then they burn out. It's pretty remarkable that in her 80s, she still generates the same warmth and excitement as ever. The Queen has developed this into an absolute art form, how to get round the maximum number of people, make as many people as possible feel that they've made some kind of contact, some small human connection with her. The thing is, when you're in the presence of the Queen, you're, you are keyed up and uh, you, know, you, you, you want to be your best. You want the occasion to be um, something you can talk to everybody about afterwards. That, of course, is the magic of, of what she is wherever she goes. Yes. The real human exchange that happens there is not a facsimile and is not drummed up by the press. It's, it's something about the best of us. If we've come to take this for granted, it's worth remembering that she would never have become queen if her uncle hadn't been a failed, unsuccessful monarch. On a cold, sunny January day, the body of his late majesty, King George V, starts on its last journey from Sandringham. Behind the coffin walks his majesty the king, their royal highnesses the Duke of York, the Duke of Gloucester, the Duke of Kent and Lord Harwood. She was nine years old when her grandfather, George V, died. As he was lying in state, part of the imperial state crown fell from the top of his coffin. His heir, Uncle David, as she called him, the Prince of Wales, saw this and wondered if it was a bad omen. It was. 1936 would become the year of the Three Kings. Edward VIII reigned for just 325 days, surrendering the throne to marry the twice-divorced American Wallace Simpson. He was the bad king, the Windsor who got it wrong. Vain and self-indulgent, he demonstrated that charisma, while useful in politics or entertainment, is a dangerous confection for a constitutional monarch. He was bored by duty, left official papers lying around with whiskey stains on them. Could the Queen's moral seriousness have been an instinctive reaction to her uncle's short and disastrous reign? It must have been a terribly cruel betrayal for her because he was such an enjoyable, relaxed member of the family. Um, in this very stiff sort of environment. And then suddenly she discovers, it must have been revealed to her at the time of the abdication, that he's blotted his copybook in this terrible way, in a way that they probably didn't want 
Her mother and father couldn't talk to her about Mrs. Simpson, divorced women, all this yeah. sort of thing. Um, the very s silence about it, um, people going quiet when she came into the room, this must have made it all the more awful and all the more of a betrayal. With barely time for the country to take it all in, the Queen's father was crowned King George VI. 11-year-old Princess Elizabeth was a little shocked to realize she would have to move into the drafty Buckingham Palace. But she caught the sense of magic, writing of the coronation. I thought it all very, very wonderful, and I expect the Abbey did too. The arches and beams at the top were covered with a sort of haze of wonder as Papa was crowned. Papa was only 41, and the prospect of her own reign must have seemed unimaginably distant. But that quiet little family, her mother's sense of fun, her sister Princess Margaret's mischief, what they called We Four, would now be changed forever. That's our royal family. And it's a family whose joys and sorrows are much like yours and mine, I suspect. The new King George VI moved his family out of the comfortable and familiar house in Piccadilly and into the grandeur of Buckingham Palace. Imagine what it must have felt like for the young girls. And the shift certainly pushed the father and his older, rather serious 10-year-old daughter who he now knew was going to be queen, much more closely together. Her childhood was comfortable, but not exactly crowded. No random friendships, city streets for looking down at, not for walking on. Remarkably, even then, security issues, including Irish Republican threats, loomed over the girls. Elizabeth and Margaret lived in a world dominated by family jokes and private games, often played in a kind of anti-palace hidden away in the grounds of Royal Lodge Windsor. The people of Wales gave Ubuthin Bach the little house to her on her sixth birthday, and here she'd play and read books, beginning a tradition that now includes her granddaughter, Princess Beatrice. Granny and her sister played here um, growing up, and you know, we've been lucky enough to play here, and, and cousins and, and second cousins, and it's a big mm. family, family yeah. treat. It's the most glamorous Wendy house ever, but. Um, it's really beautiful, and what you're seeing at ours now is after a, sort of a year renovation which you Which you've been in charge of? Yeah, well, I've been one of the, one of the people, but um, it's, been re it's com completely been rethatched and new curtains, new wiring, new um, mm. sort of bit, of a, bit of a spruce up, really, because it was such, you know, it's such a wonderful little place that, you know, if you want to have a look inside. Can we see inside? Have a little look. Wow. Okay. So as you see, <laughs> as you see, it's yeah. all sort of all the little all the little china and glass and everything was sort of created for it's got, especially for the house. It's got a very 1930s feel to it, doesn't it? Yes, it does. The kitchen is very 1930s too. Granny was very, you know, was very clear that all the fabric she wanted very little, very little designs because it was such a little house that she, you know, so we've gone for very little flowers and little rosebuds and we have some quite new modern friends that have <laughs> made, right have made well. their appearance as well. But but she spent she spent many many happy hours and days here as a girl. Yeah, she did. And, uh, and still now she likes to come back and visit and and it's you know it's wonderful that we can have you know say granny's a great grandmother now so we can have savannah come and come and play in here as well it's fantastic. and more great grandchildren in the future as a child granny never went to school when her mother was urged to get her more books they all turned out to be comedies by pg woodhouse but she learned French, and she was taught about the Constitution by an eccentric history teacher from Eton. More important, the new king was passing on his own advice, and despite his stammer and lack of readiness for the role, was growing in confidence himself. During World War II, the whereabouts of the princesses was a national secret. In fact, they were at Windsor Castle, from where they made a radio broadcast to the children of Britain. Thousands of you in this country have had to leave your homes and be separated from your fathers and mothers. 
My sister, Margaret Rose, and I feel so much for you, as we know from experience what it means to be away from those we love most of all. You only have to look at pictures of the Queen's father before and after the war to see the toll it took on him, a dramatic aging. But this was also the time when the ties were more tightly bound. I think that was the time when the Queen got closest of all to her father. And to see him wasting away um, in, in front of her, and you wonder, was she aware, you know, that even as she's losing her father and can see his mortality, what that means for her and how that's going to limit her own personal life. He was really the only person from whom Princess Elizabeth could learn about how to reign, how far to go with the politicians, how to do the paperwork. He'd become a revered symbol of the British, reliable, constant, still in his mid-50s. For her, an anchor. King George VI's death came 60 years ago here at Sandringham, the private estate he loved so much. His daughter was then 25, she had two children of her own, but this sudden death pitched her straight into the public and private world of remorseless meetings and duties, which she's always taken with the same kind of dead straight seriousness that she learned from him. She was considerably younger than you are now when she became queen. Um, do you ever sort of reflect on what an extraordinary jump that must have been from a relatively private life suddenly thrust into that role at her age? Yeah, definitely. And, and one of the things that's also really struck me when I sort of look back at it now was also in a very probably male-dominated age where it must have been extremely daunting to be put in that position. Um, and that age, you know, I, I, and I still have trouble trying to be serious about certain things. So for her at that age, it must have been incredible having that burden and that responsibility placed on you. She's shouldered the responsibility since then. One day, after his father, it will land on Prince William's shoulders. But what is the essence of that responsibility? What's the point of a constitutional monarch? What really is the job for? Well, first, the Queen is head of state, and the state is a political creation. One of the most important of the monarch's duties is something the Queen has done thousands of times, her weekly audiences with the Prime Minister. These meetings mostly happen here in the deep privacy of the Queen's apartments at Buckingham Palace. The Queen's first Prime Minister was Winston Churchill, a titanic figure she found a great speaker. The Queen can do no wrong. He saw things in a very romantic and, and glittering way. But perhaps a less good listener. Since then, she's had 11 British Prime Ministers alone, and at the heart of the relationship are those totally confidential conversations, compared by one official to a weekly meeting with a therapist. It's simply two people sitting down talking in an entirely uh, relaxed and informal way, but they cover everything. I mean, the Queen, as uh, head of state, uh, has a right to know what is happening, has a right to know what her Prime Minister has in mind to do. I certainly found I could discuss anything with her in total confidence, and that included, by the way, all sorts of cabinet ructions and difficulties. As the Queen has grown ever more experienced and grown older and her Prime Ministers have grown younger, the balance has changed. Perhaps the most pivotal, important premiership of all was that of Margaret Thatcher. Good evening, Your Majesty. You've had a very long, yes. long day. Yes, no, no, just a little bit today. Would you, you start? In 1986, the Sunday Times suggested the Queen thought Mrs. Thatcher was uncaring and confrontational, that the Queen was a political infighter prepared to take on her Prime Minister. However, the Queen always saw the point of Margaret Thatcher. She admired her guts and she was intrigued by this self-made female leader. I am the 10th Prime Minister of Queen Elizabeth II's reign. Tony Blair's New Labour presented a different problem, a vigorous government of self-proclaimed modernizers, which Whitehall insiders said had little instinctive feel for monarchy. Being in power changed that. 
you know, the fact is any prime minister ends up with, with unexpected events and happenings and crises, and you need to be able to, to come through those and, and handle them, and actually handle them psychologically as well as politically. Um, and I often used to talk to her about the past, about previous prime ministers, what it was like, what, how they handled things. And she was, you know, she, she was prepared within the context of the audience to be very frank and open and informative, in fact. I mean, I think they want to do a deal if they possibly can. The question is whether we can get everyone through it yeah. at the end of this week, really. But it's, uh, for the new countries particularly, they want one. That's, and that's the best chance we've got of getting one. You can imagine. We now have an older, grandmotherly queen who remembers so many forgotten scandals and got past that one crises. The Queen has, according to the great Victorian journalist Walter Badgett, the right to be consulted, to advise and to warn. And the more experience she has, the more, perhaps, that means. And today, it's David Cameron's turn. We're recording this as it happens on Budget Day and at a time when British pilots are flying over Libya. So there will be a great deal for the Prime Minister and the Queen to talk about once they get down to the meat of their conversation. What will she say to him? What will he reply? We will never know. And that is the point. But here's a rare glimpse that David Cameron's probably keeping his dynamite news or his best gossip for when the camera has gone. But it was a lively, actually, I'd warm them up a bit before having a question time. Oh, yes. But they were also on Mondays, we had the great Libyan. I hear you went to Libyan thing. That was, the Hatch Holmes was an amazingly. It's probably the only meeting, um, apart from seeing Mrs. Cameron at the end of the day, is about the only meeting where there's no one else in the room. And uh, I feel the responsibility as Prime Minister to try and explain my perspective on the big issues going on in the world and the country that week. Does it make you think So it makes clearly? me think, absolutely, because there's no one else in the room, because there are no minutes taken. Um, I think you, uh, you reveal both to her, but also to yourself, your deepest thinking and deepest worries about these issues. And sometimes that can really help you to... Uh, reach the answers. Well, that, that sounds quite sensible. It was good. Full of, full of warnings, mainly for me. <laughs> it was very good. It was very good. And I sat in the chamber and listened. But does all this really matter? What's it for? Has it in any way changed the lives of the British? The Prime Minister is the executive arm of the government, and the monarch has this extraordinarily important set of ceremonial uh, duties. That means that the country whatever it thinks of its politicians, can feel a great sense of ownership and unity uh, around um, the institution of the royal family, and in particular Her Majesty the Queen, I think gives us not only all the advantages in terms of uh, people wanting to come to Britain and engage with Britain, but gives us a huge advantage of stability. <laughs> stays on top of things. She reads the newspapers, not just the Racing Post, the lot. She really does. Good morning. Good morning. She listens to the radio and the evening news on television, and every day, wherever she may be, those fat, heavy red cabinet boxes arrive, brimming with closely typed paperwork, carried to her through the corridors of the palace. In these boxes, have been some of the deepest secrets of the British state over the last 60 years, what they really thought in Whitehall during the most dangerous parts of the Cold War, when the world was on the edge of nuclear annihilation, what they really felt about some of the big domestic stories, those great confrontations when Margaret Thatcher was prime minister, or the true story of Tony Blair and taking the country to war in Iraq and Afghanistan, the fight between Blair and Brown. The Queen really has had an absolute ringside seat for everything that's most important. They call her, in number 10, reader number one. Here is British democracy's reader number one, always ready for when the next box of documents arrives. Why does she read those papers? Is it important that she sees the secrets of the state and knows what's going on? If she's going to fulfill that function of keeping prime ministers and secretaries of state on their toes, 
in her weekly meeting with the Prime Minister or the bilateral she regularly has with the big ministers. She's got to be well primed. And she has this enormous accumulated compost of memory and knowledge. But you have to keep it up to speed. It's, it's, I suspect it's her equivalent of athletic training. It's her workout. I've heard it said that there are only three people in government who really truly understand what's going on. The Chief Secretary to the Treasury, the Prime Minister and the Queen. One of her former private secretaries, way back in the 70s, said that if she wasn't on top of all of this stuff, very quickly people would notice. Prime ministers, ministers, ambassadors, foreign, would realise that she didn't know what was going on. And sort of something soggy and soft would happen at the apex of the state. I think that's probably true, although, to be honest, quite a lot of the Queen's functions are almost rubber stamping. Mm. I think, on a more personal level, if the Queen didn't keep up this great discipline of having to read every single day and keep on top of things, she might never be able to catch up again, or she would feel under pressure. And she has an iron discipline to read. Iron discipline is, of course, a military quality, and the Queen grew up often surrounded by men with regimental instincts for timekeeping, order, dress code and duty. Responsibility was drummed into her. Her South African speech, aged 21, is the speech of a true believer in monarchy, nationhood, God and destiny. There is a motto which has been borne by many of my ancestors, a noble motto. I serve. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. So this is the woman who became queen. We've seen the way her reading and her private meetings with politicians mesh at the heart of the British state. But what about the grand public occasions, such as the opening of Parliament, which she's done 58 times? Britain, unlike other countries, has no written constitution, no founding document. Her authority is more like an ancient echo, a half-hidden mystery. And this is the room that you never see. This is the robing room. And uh, the Queen will come in here and the imperial state crown, which with the other jewellery, has arrived in its own coach from the Tower of London, and then she gets robed. This is not the House of Lords, and it's not the House of Commons. This is the Queen's bit of the Palace of Westminster. And it's really important symbolically, because the monarchy, the state, the unending United Kingdom, meets the day-to-day -day world of politicians arguing about the things that politicians argue about. And when the Queen leaves this room with that great crown on and all the regalia, she is going to speak the words of a here-today, gone-tomorrow politician, the Prime Minister of the day. But she is still the Queen. She is not the government. It's her government, but she is not the government. And this is a crucial distinction. My lords, pray be seated. In modern times, the state opening of Parliament can look like a gaudy pantomime or convocation of playing cards, but its political significance is real enough. My lords and members of the House of Commons, my government's legislative programme will be based upon the principles of freedom, fairness and responsibility. And yet all the work at home is only part of what she does. A lot of the Queen's life has been about travelling abroad. Again, why? Why is she the most well-travelled monarch in history? Why has she made more than 325 overseas visits to more than 130 countries, going far beyond the states she reigns over, or even the Commonwealth? They included Russia, where revolutionaries killed her relative, Tsar Nicholas II and his family, and communist China. 
All of this costs money. Does it really bring Britain much in return? Does her presence make a real difference to the way we sell ourselves abroad? Well, yes, it does. It, 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 it undoubtedly adds great weight to how we sell, and it draws attention to us selling ourselves abroad. Uh, the Queen doesn't do trade deals. The Queen isn't uh, actually herself soliciting business for the country. Um, but the presence of the Queen draws enormous attention. And her travels take her deep into Republican territory, too. Here in the United States, you might think that in hard-boiled New York, people don't miss continuity or a sense of history. But you'd be wrong. She's like an icon in the community. Um, like here in America, you don't really see as much females with her statue. So I think she has a great influence. I like that she's a remnant of the past, though. I like that, though. You don't see too many of the monarchs still around, so I don't mind the queen. We love the queen. Love That's the queen. fantastic. I didn't know that yeah, she would be cool. here. High five. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> I, I know. That's really cool when she's coming here, though. She's here to make a speech at the United Nations, the organization set up to promote world peace. It's a speech she's worked hard on. The four largest current providers of peacekeeping troops in the world are Commonwealth countries. She's head of state of 16 United Nations members, so this matters to her. The Queen makes speeches all the time, but she's not one of those people who like the sound of their own voice. She is pleased when the speeches are over. Public speaking is a routine, familiar, well-oiled ordeal. In less than two hours' time, the Queen is going to be standing there addressing the United Nations. First time she's done it since 1957. This assembly was born of the endeavours of countless men and women. Back then, she was upbeat and optimistic, and so she will be today. You might say, mostly her story has been the triumph of optimism and hope over bitter experience. But after all, that is the story of monarchy, and it's the story of the United Nations, too. It has perhaps always been the case that the waging of peace is the hardest form of leadership of all. That was a really important speech, and she was able to, to go there and talk a lot about foreign policy aspects, talk about the successes that the UN has had and the issues that are still troubling it, about failed states. Uh, so, you know, she, she can do an enormous amount. The Queen is not controversial, and therefore everybody feels included in, 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 in when she goes abroad. And that, there's, a, there's a completely different atmosphere. When the Queen comes down the stairs, as it were, it's, it's different from where anybody else doing it. It just is different. In tomorrow's world, we must all work together as hard as ever if we are truly to be United Nations. Rousing speeches aren't really her thing. In truth, the way the Queen connects best is with a personal touch. It's November 2010 in Abu Dhabi, and the Queen is in the Gulf. Once the Windsors were King Emperors, now they travel as would-be wealth creators, promoters, first onto the beaches with the politicians and the businessmen at their backs. It strikes me that this has become a place which matters an awful lot to, I mean, Manchester City fans, but also to a lot of workers as it's well, not, I'm pretty sure. It's, it's, not just, um, uh, it's not just the UAE, it's the whole region. Yeah. Um, hugely important from um, uh, the business opportunities, the business case, there's an awful lot going on. Um, I've been coming to this region now for whatever it is, nearly 12 years. Yes. Um, and developing the relationships. And, and this part of the world needs continuous hand and, and touch. And personal contacts matter yeah. a lot. Oh, hugely. It's really, hugely. Yeah. And, and the fact that Her Majesty's coming uh, now is really, really important, especially after the, the new government has given yeah. and reinvigorated the relationship with the whole of the region. But, uh, as you can see, the aeroplane is rolling up now. Yes, I, to work. I, I mustn't keep them from the Queen. Thanks very much. Thank you. Monarchies are a minority in today's world, but they're hardly unusual. 
40 odd countries have monarchs, depending on how you count them, and there's no doubt that monarchs have a natural curiosity about one another, which can oil the wheels of trade. The King's and Queen's Club. Tonight, this queen is greeted by the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi. So, straight from the airport, her first stop is the exuberant Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque, one of the world's largest and partly the work of British companies. Shoeless, the queen whose range of hats is famous, now wears her tribute to local fashion, including her version of the traditional abaya gown. She meets children learning the Quran rather late at night. One of the things that's changed in the Queen's reign, and she is now very conscious of, is that she is also Queen of 1.6 million British Muslims. Ambassador, what does it actually mean in concrete terms for Britain that the Queen comes all the way out here? It's tremendously important for the relationship. This is a country that counts for the UK. It counts because 100, 120,000 British people live here. It counts because of their security. So the defense and security relationship between the UK and UAE with our troops serving alongside each other in Afghanistan, with our law enforcement agencies intercepting bombs on the way to the UK I is suppose very important. Yemen's just round one corner and Iran's over the water. So it's a pretty important place. If there was no royal family, if we were a republic, what would be the difference, do you think? It will be shallow, shallow, shallow. How big a deal is it? This is probably the most important bilateral contact between the UK and the UAE of the decade. The one thing you have to realize when you're abroad is that people absolutely adore the notion of the British monarchy. They're fascinated by it. They want to know about it. I mean, if I'm whatever part of the world I'm in, they will always ask me about the Queen, about what it's like, about the monarchy. Um, and so for us as a country, it's a no-brainer, actually, in terms of, of what they bring, because yes. they, they, they bring something no one else can. The pinnacle, of course, is the Queen's visit, but it's what's going on beforehand, where the political context is, what's going on uh, with the relationship, uh, and then you've then got to look at what happens afterwards. And it's, it's, it's the gathering of those strands that you pull together and then, as it were, the Queen is the person who, who, who sort of cinches them at that one particular moment. And so these are special and they add shine, varnish, uh, and to some extent, paint uh, to the canvas that is the relationship between us and another country. <laughs> The Queen's visit continues to the kingdom of Oman, ruled by an old friend of hers, Sultan Qaboos. At times, it feels more like Narnia. Bagpipe-playing camel-mounted soldiers, glittering forts. But Oman counts, an oasis of relative peace in an increasingly angry region. Often ignored by her people at home, the Queen has been helping keep Britain quietly plugged in around the world for 60 years. She seems to enjoy it. That is the job. But for a woman of her age, the politicians keep on pushing her hard. Is there any sense that um, sometimes it's a bit much to ask a, a, a lady of her age to undertake some of these huge trips? Well, not really. I mean, of course, one naturally thinks, uh, would it be a bit much? But uh, very clearly, it isn't a bit much. I mean, she's extremely well rehearsed at these sort of things now. But having done that for so many years, it must be incredibly tiring and is extremely emotionally draining. Um, but she's led the way in, in doing walkabouts and um, with engagements, and long may that continue. At that level of head of state, with the Queen as our monarch, with the institution of the royal family, even if you come at it with a sort of cold heart and a clear head, it is a brilliant organization for Britain. The experience of following the Queen, even for a short time, takes you to some strange places and involves a great deal of exotic transportation. It's sometimes like ordinary life, with the colour balance turned up so high, it's almost shrieking. But it's hot, 
hard work, and underneath the clatter and glitter, rather more hard-headed and down-to-earth than it looks. For 60 years, the Queen has been, many people would say, an adornment. What she isn't is an ornament. It could have been done differently, running this monarchy in modern times, juggling old authority and noisy democracy hasn't just happened. It's been carefully thought through by the Queen, her father, her grandfather, and their advisors. They had an idea, a plan, and by and large, they've stuck to it. 